Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Tanya and I'm the editor of The Internationalist. Today we are joined by Dr. Lamia Kareem, who's professor and head of department at, and at Department of Anthropology at the University of Oregon. Welcome, Dr. Kareem. Thank you. In today's edition of The Internationalist, Dr. Kareem and I will discuss her most recent book, Cast of Capital, Work and Love Among Garment Workers of Bangladesh which delves into the world of women garment workers in Bangladesh to understand how they cope with the challenges of their work and personal lives, all the while under the influence of global capital. The book also recently received the prestigious Society of Cultural Anthropology's Gregory Bateson Prize Honorable Mention. So congratulations, Dr. Kareem. Thank you. Um, just to begin our discussion, um, the first question that I sort of came up with as soon as I finished reading your wonderful book was how your work delved into the fascinating dynamics of modernity in Bangladesh, highlighting the integrated relationship between economic development, women's empowerment, and the diverse sociocultural influences in this rapidly changing society. So with the concept of modernity evolving and impacting women's experiences, could you tell us more about how these experiences and their ideas of modernity, even when challenged, influence the lives and dreams of women in a society traditionally tied to agrarian customs? And how might these experiences reflect the broader global story of modernity in our increasingly interconnected world? Sure. Well, thank you very much. That's a very good question and a complex question. Um, so let me just say a little bit about the twin processes of modernity and modernization. Bangladesh is a very transnationalized place from its entry into the global economy in 1972 after the war uh, with Pakistan and our independence, that it was at a time when um, in some parts of the West, not everywhere, people were thinking about our governments were, especially in UK and a little later in the US, about moving into a privatization of many aspects of the welfare state. That's a very early point, but I'm saying Bangladesh enters it at that particular historical juncture. So in Bangladesh, um, the left has been very marginalized and pretty much obliterated uh, by the early 1980s. Just to give you a little bit of history so you understand um, how this happened is that during uh, our uh, time with Pakistan, which was between 47 and 1971, um, the majority of that time was under military dictatorship and the military really curbed and stifled left political voices and persecuted a, left, a lot of the left uh, um, you know, uh, party leaders. Then after 71, which is we gain independence at the end of um, December, December 16, 1971. So from 72 onwards, slowly, as the war-torn country is building itself, what happens in Bangladesh is a massive influx of foreign aid and NGOs. And these institutions uh, are the purveyors of ideas around modernity and also about modernization. Um, and these institutions target rural uh, communities. And once they targeted rural communities, they began to work with local uh, NGOs that were slowly cropping up. And the reason Bangladesh within a very short time became like the NGO capital of the world, even today, if you go to Bangladesh, NGOs are very prominent in the society. And um, people talk about NGOs all the time. And NGOs pretty much took up the state or uh, the role of a quasi state in rural areas while, you know, by 19. 76, we were already again under military occupation and the military focused on uh, the middle classes and urban areas and trying to consolidate its power, but also, you know, having an outward look towards um, the West as well as the Islamic world. 
And so a lot of the ideas about modernity and modernization in Bangladesh comes from the idea of uh, idea that were ideas that were brought by these Western bilateral uh, organizations. And so if you ask uh, people in um, Bangladesh, educated middle class people about, you know, what is our modernity in Bangla, that's Adhunikota, they will immediately say women's empowerment. Do you see what I mean? They're not thinking in terms of uh, other kinds of subjects that not the Western subject of someone who's, you know, moving away the traditional concept of parochialism, religious dogma, and uh, and embracing science, reason, and enlightenment ideas of democracy, freedom, rule of law, etc., rights of the citizen. But they're thinking in very economic terms, like the woman's empowerment. And the idea is that through that empowerment, women coming out of their houses or in starting to work, whether as microfinance and, and entrepreneurs, so-called, I'll put it, <laughs> uh, that the Grameen Bank made famous, or as now, you know, garment workers, that they, they are the ones who will become the um, wheels of society in a way. And women in Bangladesh, I will say this much, has worked very hard, especially uh, rural women. They have been in, instrumentalized for development uh, projects and processes, and they have paid a very, very high price for it, for the country to move forward. Um, that said, uh, what I'm trying to talk about is that in it's a very particular kind of way that people in Bangladesh think of modernity. Um, and if you at any time have a question, please stop me. Um, so the one thing you see in Bangladesh is that when we are thinking of, about modernity and how these women rural women and their families and rural men uh, are encountering modernity is through, um, one is through increased mobility and movement, right? People are moving from rural areas to urban areas and they're getting exposed to new ideas uh, there. They're seeing different lifestyles. Um, and of course, a lot of it is about consumerism, right? You have these fancy, you know, shopping malls, etc. that these women now see, but they cannot really participate in them. They are always looking in from outside. But they are these um, consumerist ideas also give them some sense of like hope for one day it will be maybe my life will be like that, or maybe my daughter's life will be like that. My children will have a better life. So that is very, very much rooted in these women's narratives. A popular culture is also a very big thing. I mean, on Friday, which is the day off for them, they usually sit and watch telenovelas, uh, very popular. A lot of the time they are also watching ones from, you know, produced in Kolkata <laughs> because we are Bengalis. They understand. And, you know, Hindi um, Bollywood movies are also popular. So all those images are coming to them. And but what is it that they're thinking in terms of um, modernity? is um, largely consumerism and alongside upward mobility. So it is because, as I said in the beginning, the left has been so eviscerated, there's very little left political dialogue in Bangladesh. So um, these women who could have been, you know, um, mobilized by left political parties, if it was a vibrant alternative are really being mobilized by consumerism more and ideas of upward mobility uh, that they think that you know they are moving into a middle class uh, occupation by being garment workers and one very interesting thing when you talk to them they never call themselves uh, workers or karma uh, jibi in bangla um, they always say, uh, they don't say they're going to the factory. They say they're going to office, which is an identity of being middle class. You know, the they see, you know, their uh, uh, managers at the factories coming in cars and they're, you know, going to the office. So, um, so that's how it works. And um, 
the broader narrative then is about it's uh, and it's about upward mobility largely and a swirl of aspirations that have taken over these women and i'm quoting carla freeman here who i quote a lot in my book uh who worked on uh in barbados um that it is not about a workers movement or a political struggle it's about um improving their work conditions definitely they're very aware of that and uh, receiving wages that will be fair, but at the same time, uh, moving upward in terms of class mobility. So I think this global narrative is about being part of a global world, which will be dominated by consumerism, the good life of uh, consumer goods, uh, better wages. Um, they also want better health care and education for their children so their children can also move up that ladder, but they're not going to work. They don't want them to work in factories. They want them to work, you know, in uh, prof professional middle-class jobs, become teacher, engineers, whatever. Although that rarely happens. Have I answered your question? Yeah, you have. I mean, and you went into like a lot of detail, which I really appreciate. And I think our readers will as well. And um, the way you end also provides us a nice little segue into my next question, which is, um, you know, the transformations that has happened in recent times in uh, Bangladesh, especially following the 2013 Rana Plaza catastrophe. And your book does delve into um, the aftermath of that tragedy. And you mentioned the upgrades in fac factory conditions and the adoption of international treaties like the Accord and Alliance and how they've improved some aspects of workers' life. However, it's also evident that many challenges continue to persist, including issues like low wages and the environmental impact of fast fashion. Um, so could you share your insights on how these challenges have affected not only the lives of women government workers, but also the broader socioeconomic and environmental landscape in Bangladesh? And if you see a sustainable path forward for both the industry and the workers that you know, just goes beyond the utilitarian approach. Sure. Um, so um, 2013, when the Rana Plaza industrial catastrophe occurred, for your readers, I'll just uh, you know repeat that about more than a thousand workers, 1100 plus workers, were crushed in that uh, when the factory collapsed on itself. It was it was not supposed to be a factory. It was kind of rigged into a factory with no oversight whatsoever. And over 2,500 workers were seriously uh, injured, uh, both physically and many of them mentally, the horror of that accident, right? So after that, it, global retailers like Walmart, you know, Target, Chivo, uh, or Primark, all these places could no longer hide. You know, they didn't even have a, have a fig leaf, leaf to hide and pretend that things were okay in Bangladesh uh, factories. So they had to come forward. And some of and this is was also very good that uh, many of the Western European countries, also Canada, uh, including the US uh, under um, Obama, they said that factories have to be upgraded. The reason I say that is people knew about it all along, but nobody was addressing them. And this is not the first time that accidents happened in Bangladeshi factories. It has been an ongoing problem. Um, so then, you know, international treaties were introduced, like the Accord, which is more legally binding and is a better one than Alliance, which is actually a fake one that uh, Gap and uh, Walmart and uh, Amazon now they have kind of signed on to it, which does not make them legally binding. But I don't want to go into the legal aspects of that. I want to talk about um, what were some of the outcomes of this, right? Yes, workers' wages were increased after a long time. And the 
that was in 2014. Um, and then uh, some new um, measurement measures were introduced, such as that every five years, they would have an review of their wages and uh, there would be a wage board that would look at you know cost of living index and uh, try to adjust um, wages of, in proportion to that um, right now there are again workers in Bangladesh are again going through uh, a wage crisis they are out on the streets um, asking for uh, the proper increase in their wages that the factory owners are always very reluctant to give. So, but th that's going on. You may read about it in the papers. Um, so some thing, good things happened. Another good thing that happened was that um, trade unions had some of the restrictions lifted on them because uh, Bangladesh garment industry has 4 million uh, workers, but uh, trade unions cannot really organize them because they have to get 30% of you know, all the workers to sign up. And it's very difficult to do that because some of these factories have large labor force. Um, so at least in um, for a long time, it was like 2% of the workers were unionized and they were usually in the smaller factories with maybe a thousand workers or 2000 workers, but not in the larger ones where you could have you know, thousands of workers. Um, so that was a good thing because that discourse um, opened up and people could talk more about workers' rights. Um, but if you look at the idea of fast fashion, which is every two weeks, now literally every two weeks you're changing fashion, right? And cheaply produced, mass produced clothes. And Bangladesh is at the forefront of that. Um, and Bangladeshi workers are being used to, you know, mass produce these uh, clothes that are maybe worn once or twice and then thrown away. Um, so one of the things that has not been addressed in Bangladesh, although a lot has been written about uh, the conditions of garment workers, their wages, their living conditions, health conditions, you can just look online and it's like voluminous research on that, right? Everybody after 2013 ran to see what was going on. Uh, but um, very little is being said about uh, the pollution, the environmental pollution, the toxicity into the environment that is being released, right? If you about, you know, a fast fashion, I produces something around 10% of pollution. Uh, maybe, you know, the number could be a little higher. Um, because uh, most of it comes from use of synthetics in the production of polyester. It also, and uh, from dyeing uh, clothes, um, you use tons of chemicals. And then, of course, a massive use of water. Um, and then what do the factories do? Uh, the factories release the industrial waste and water into the local uh, water bodies and into the local environments. If you go to these neighborhoods where uh, the factories are and they're really packed, uh, a lot of uh, slums have grown around them. That's where the workers live, their families, and also you know other people who work are in some ways connected with these factories or in other kinds of occupations. There they are all constantly saying that they're suffering from headaches, upper respiratory problems, uh, often they will have a skin rash, things that have that are a result of this uh, industry. Um, another thing that has happened around the factories that are in um, areas that are close to urban uh, Dhaka city, like Ghazipur, uh, Shabar, um, a lot of the agricultural land has been completely destroyed because the industrial waste is being pushed into the water bodies and the agricultural land in many areas is tar black and you cannot grow anything. And the farmers who are trying to work their land, they say that they are developing all sorts of um, like skin diseases and headaches in trying to work the land. And the, the land doesn't really work because uh, it's being destroyed. 
and as well as the fish, marine life in um, these um, local rivers have been, you know, also poisoned in, and or full of chemicals and toxins that pe local people are eating because the fish, you know, they catch the fish, they send it in the market and, you know, people eat that. And so there's very little attention to that. Um, I think it'll happen. Um, and this is partly um, how these things work is that it takes some time for someone to say, oh, no, you know, we have to look at this research. And Bangladesh has a very good organization called Bangladesh Environmental Lawyers Association, BELA. And they do some of the work, but they I talked to them and I was doing my research and they hadn't done anything on this. And you have to realize that often how these organizations operate is when um, someone um, from the West, these bilateral aid organizations, or they come and say, I, I shouldn't call them aid organizations, they're development organizations, uh, because this is not free. <laughs> it's always uh, tied to their own uh, you know, mandates, and that, um, you know, let's look at this. They give them some money and then they do the research. Or you will have university professors who might have their students look at it, but then that doesn't go outside the classroom, right? Um, what is the path forward then? The path forward is of people taking up this um, global uh, discussion on environmental pollution. And I think that is going to happen soon. People in Bangladesh are talking about it, but not to the extent that they should be talking about. Um, in terms of what is the cost of uh, this industry? And I'm not saying this industry should go away, not at all. It has done a lot of good for uh, Bangladeshi society, um, but it has to be improved. It has to be monitored, right? And we have to look at uh, the local effects of what happens when factories um, operate, you know, without any accountability or lack of accountability in certain areas, such as environmental pollution. Back to you, Tanya. <laughs> The, I mean, it's it's true. I mean, what you said about the environmental concerns, um, and I mean, we do see that in certain. I mean, at like a very small level, I think in India also about you know just concerns mm -hmm. about uh, people's health, public health, mm -hmm. and um, especially where I am right now in Delhi, it's so polluted, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's it's a hazard. Um, but there is very little that, um, there's very little willingness, I would say, to sort of really um, raise voices and do something about it. I guess like once the crop burning season is over and the pollution is a little abated, uh, people just go back to their lives and then the cycle just continues. So, yeah, I mean, I quite agree with you. Um, so as I was reading your book, um, one of the things that, I mean, really struck me was the glimpse that you offer us into Bangladeshi men's perceptions of women working in the garment industry and how these perceptions are evolving amidst traditional norms and shifting gender roles. So I'd love to hear your insights on how these changing attitudes towards romance, marriage, sexuality among men not only affect personal relationships, but also have wider societal implications. And if you could also share any examples for our readers from your research that sort of um, point towards a way to bridge these gaps and foster a more equitable gender relationships in uh, Bangladesh's changing society. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and I do want to mention first that, you know, um, gender inequity and gender-based violence is not a Bangladeshi problem, it's a global problem. It happens across uh, the world. Definitely, where I live in the United States now, it's a huge problem. So I just want to tell your readers that they must not associate it with Bangladeshi men, but let me just give you some background to you know what has happened uh, to you know 
opportunities for uh, men in uh, Bangladesh, especially we are talking about, you know, men in uh, lower socioeconomic status and also in the, you know, working in the rural economy. So when you look at um, the way Bangladesh entered the global economy, largely through these um, international development organizations such as DFID, you know, CEDA, uh, that's a Swedish uh, aid organization, uh, development organization, DCID is UK, and a plethora of them, Danita, which is Danish, that the idea was to um, target uh, women in rural areas, and they didn't really focus on men. The idea was to liberate uh, Bangladeshi Muslim women, Bangladesh is uh, primarily Muslim, and to mainstream them into the labor market. Um, but if you look at society and you look at families, men and women are relational. They are not separate, but you're kind of taking the woman out and focusing on her instead of focusing on both men and women together. So um, that created a lot of friction within families because um, men were not getting opportunities such as, you know, um, women were being uh, given training sessions by, by NGOs and some NGOs in rural areas would hire them to become like health workers, but men were not being um, targeted in the same way. So uh, the men begin to feel that, you know, they become very masculated in terms of not being able to be the traditional providers and of the family, they their spouses, wives may now let's move to the garment industry, uh, are the ones who are uh, able to earn money because the factories uh, prefer women um, for a variety of reasons, uh, not just part largely because they can be kept voiceless and they can be made to work hard and they are not going to argue with their managers as much. So um, factories also exploit uh, women's gender position in Bangladesh. And, um, and, and, you know, this is true for factories in Mexico and, you know, Guatemala and Vietnam and elsewhere as well, um, that women are seen as more pliant and in the workplace. Um, but the man feels that I'm not getting, you know, I'm the man, I should be the person who should have the money and the job, but I now my wife makes more than me. I have to ask her for money and I'm not going to accept that. So it creates a lot of uh, friction and, and the anger is taken out on the woman. It's, and that I'm, I mean, one cannot condone anything like that. It's horrific. Some of the things I have found and I've written about it. Um, but what is the way forward? How do we change these uh, very, um, to well, I guess I would call it toxic masculinity. How do we change that? One way would be to um, also focus on men because women are being uh, targeted for a lot of different kinds of training sessions, like in the garment industry, um, you know, labor rights organizations will train women to teach them about their rights under the labor law of Bangladesh, you know, um, how to speak to their managers if they're not getting paid or they're not getting, you know, some of their other um, benefits uh, that they get, uh, such as, you know, uh, sick days, etc. But they're not doing the same with men. They're not uh, getting them, targeting them and bringing them together and saying, you know, uh, wouldn't it be better if you and your wife didn't have these, uh, you didn't always argue with her, your wife at the end of the day or beat her up, etc. So I think a new discourse of masculinity and respect for women um, has to be created uh, in um, society with these women to say, okay, what are the alternatives? How, and to also, you know, show um, these men that um, if your wife, and sometimes they understand that, but you know, that if your wife is, um, is healthy and both physically and mentally, then, you know, she can work more and, you know, 
both of you can uh, earn more as a result of that. What I saw, and there are, here are some examples, I'll give you our work, uh, viewers, uh, you know, listeners, that um, in uh, families where both husband and wife were working in the factory, and I met some of them, um, it was a very different dynamic because the husband would, knew what it was like to stay late at the factory and work and then come home and then be very tired and maybe not be able to, you know, um, cook or, you know, cater to the family in the same way, take care of the family in the same way that, you know, the husband may expect and say, hey, my mother did it. Why can't, you know, was always there for me and my dad. What are you doing? So um, they are more understanding. And I have found that, um, in some cases, even if the husband and wife, they were not working in the factory, they were living, the wife was working in the factory, the husband was doing some, some other uh, job, um, but the wife couldn't come back uh, by you know seven o'clock or something because she had to stay late and work, fast fashion there. Um, and, um, but the husband would you know feed the children. He wouldn't cook the meal though, that's important. The wife would cook the meal before she went to the factory in the morning. But he would heat it up and eat, and then they, you know, those men told me that I we can see, I can see the value of uh, my wife working hard. I wish she didn't have to. I wish I could provide for the family, but um, we can live better as a result of that. So I think when you have um, meaning, if not meaningful, but you, if both husband and wife can have occupations that pay um, decent wages then the dynamic will change. Um, and um, so it's really coming back to finding, you know, uh, jobs for these men as well as the, the women. Okay, back to you again. Um, yeah, and um, I mean, this, I mean, where you end sort of also um, is the part of my question that comes after this, um, which is has to sort of do, a little bit with the aspiration of wanting a good life. And I think you spoke about it a little bit um, earlier in this interview. And um, I mean, you've, your book has provided a nuanced view of the struggles and aspirations of Bangladeshi garment workers. And, um, you know, and how they often find themselves in the midst of disputes and activism and um, your field work has also highlighted that uh, workers while engaged in demanding fair wages and better working conditions also aspire to a middle class life with security and status and i'm curious how you interpret this dual identity you know being industrial laborers while yearning for socioeconomic advancement and if there is a political discourse you know that can sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, hold accountable ac actions of various stakeholders, including left political parties, um, and you know, just reshape and align with this multifaceted subjectivity of the workers. And, you know, like you've mentioned, their desires for a good life, quote unquote. Well, <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. And uh, again, you have asked me very good questions. Um, and it is, um, it was actually at the heart of a lot of what I was doing. I mean, what I found um, that the research that was being done on these women and also the way um, activists were thinking of them was largely as one dimensional subjects, right? Or as, um, cool statistics, you know, the, the, they get the lowest wages in the world, they work in very oppressive conditions, you know, etc. But not in, not looking at these women as multidimensional and in the fullness of what it means to be human. I think that's where I go. And my project is very humanistic in that sense. I wanted to understand what, who were these women? You know, and we talk about them, but they're more than workers, right? They're mothers, they're daughters, they're sisters, they're wives, they're friends, they're lovers, they're, um, you know, they're also political agents because they are political. Um, but you have to understand the way the garment work schedules work, there's very little time for them to 
have uh, leisure or not leisure, even to have some time after work to go and attend some political rally um, because that's too late. And, you know, unless it's in their neighborhood, women will not go at night to uh, another place to a political uh, rally, but men can do that. So um, what I found was that um, the left political parties, I mean, I met with a group of them, they are very well intentioned. They want to improve the work conditions of the workers, but they are also coming from dogma. They just assume that these women are industrial workers, they have a worker's uh, subjectivity that they occupy, and what they have to do is to mobilize them and to teach them about their oppression so that they can, you know, have a, a movement for um, for workers and for the rights of them. But these people are not thinking of themselves as workers. They are thinking of themselves as upwardly mobile subjects um, and who will move out of this. Because when you talk to the women, none of them want their children to work in the garment industry at, as assembly line workers. They can be supervisors, that's okay, or a management job. Um, those are upwardly mobile jobs. So um, how do you then make um, sense of that? How, and I think part of what you have to do is to understand them. Who are they and what do they want? And why do they want what they want? Um, what are their hopes and aspirations? You know, to the end of my book, I talk about this political rally that was being held, and um, it was in Shavar, an area very close to uh, Taka, where I did the uh, bulk of my research. Um, 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 part of my research, not bulk of my research. Sorry, I went and moved around quite a bit. Um, and there, the uh, there was going to be a, in the evening. There was going to be a political rally to. Uh, educate the workers about their rights, etc. And I went and I looked at their schedule and I said, you know, these women work eight to 10 hours a day. Their lives are bereft of really um, some music or some beauty in that sense, right? Poetry, just to use that word. Uh, why don't you, they will come after eight to 10 hours of working in a factory and then they will come and listen to all of you telling them how miserable their lives are, they already know that. They're fully aware of it. Wouldn't you just change your schedule a bit and give them something, some music, some kinds, some songs, a skit maybe, a little play? That's not garment work. That's uh, fine. Um, I think that's what I would, was recommending. And they just thought I was, you know, I was talking nonsense. Here's this, you know. A professor from the United States with her, you know, American ideas saying these things. That's not how we need to do it. Um, so I was thinking that, you know, that those are the ways we have to change, that we have to uh, step out of our arrogance. And I'm a middle class woman, so I also have my own, you know, limits and my positionality also gives me uh, blind spots. Uh, but I'm also an anthropologist, so I have to constantly check myself and say, is this, what did I do? Or what, what did I say? Or why did this person react this way? And I think that the possibility is there, but I find that um, middle-class um, people, whether they are, you know, um, um, political, left political organizers or activists come from a lot of arrogance sometimes that hasn't been um, questioned when they're working with people who are uh, in economic and social subordinate positions. We are not there as saviors and people know their oppression. They may not have the same language with which to be, speak of it, but I've done this kind of research for about 25 years now. And no matter where I went, uh, people knew that they were being oppressed, but they also have, you know, um, aspirations for some things that, uh, Middle class people have and their kids have. So oh, you also have to understand that it's a hard um, question.
question that you're asking because the world has changed so much. Um, you know, I know you work for a very radical, you know, organization, but it's very hard to get that message out um, to a larger uh, body of people because they're not um, swayed by that, right? So maybe the language has to change, maybe the uh, strategies have to change, but I think first and foremost, I would say we have to examine ourselves and see um, how we are approaching this idea of um, emancipation of uh, work curse, right? You know, so they, and, uh, and how do we stand with them uh, and for them and let them, you know, advance their cause in some ways. I hope I've answered your question. Um, you have, I mean, you've gone beyond my questions, I think. And I mean, you, you're right. I mean, as I was writing this question, I asked myself, um, you know, what could be the possible answer to this? I mean, having read your book and, um, and I thought I would just, um, now I couldn't find an answer to this question. So I thought I'll look towards you and see if you have any insights for us. But I mean, yeah, definitely. Um, but also we are running out of time and, um, you know, and the whole discussion has been really insightful, Dr. Kareem. And I would like to thank you once again for um, sharing your valuable time, your work and talking about your research. Um, congratulations again about the honorable mention. Um, I'm sure you're very excited. Women uh, who share their stories. So actually the thanks go to them. It yeah. wouldn't be possible without them. So, yeah, thank you. You're very right. <laughs> um, so before we part ways, I'd like to take a moment to invite our readers to share The Internationalist with their friends. By sharing and spreading the word, you'll enable us to produce more engaging interviews like this one, as well as help build and sustain the Progressive International. Um, thank you and have a good day, Dr. Kareem. Okay. Bye-bye.